one day when heaven is filled with his praises one day when sin was as black as could be jesus came forth to be born of a virgin dwelt amongst men my example is he the word became flesh and the light shined among us Glory revealed, living he loved me, dying he saved me, buried he carried my sins far away, rising he justified freely forever. One day he's coming, oh glorious day, oh glorious day. and rejected bearing our sins my redeemer is he the hand that healed nations stretched out on a tree took the nails for me living he loved me dying he saved me buried he carried my sins far away rising he justified freely forever one day he's coming oh glorious day oh glorious day one day the grave could conceal him no longer one day the stone rolled away from the door then he arose over death he had conquered now he is my lord evermore death could not hold him the grave could not keep him rising again living he loved me dying he saved me buried he carried my sins far away rising he justified freely forever one day he's coming oh glorious day oh glorious day glorious day trumpet will sound for his coming one day the skies with his glories will shine wonderful day my beloved one is bringing my Jesus is my living he loved me dying he saved me buried he carried my sins far away Rising, he justified freely forever. He's coming, oh glorious day, glorious day, glorious day. I am reading. 
reaching out to find. gathered here this day. It's good to worship the Lord. Amen. 
I love it. I love that song, Let Your Love Take Me Deeper. When we talk about that image, we, we love the element of, of singing about deeper into God's presence, right? The, the different images of being drawn close, to gather at his feet, to, to be able to share our life to share our praises and our celebrations and our struggles and our trials and, and to seek his help, to give him acknowledgement. It's like, but then it gets to that meddling verse, I'll follow wherever you call me. I mean, we want to sing that with, with all the conviction and fervor that we sang the other part with where I'm like, oh, just draw me close, Lord. Um, but I mean, I remember, you know, in seminary, they always told us that, you know, like, okay, you're going you're gonna to go out into the church, and you're going to call the people to follow, and, and everybody's got a limit, and it's usually like, Lord, send me anywhere except for Africa. Like, wait, that, well, that's the missionaries. Um, what about people inside the church? Well, Lord, send me anywhere that I'm comfortable. Don't send me into a place, or don't send me into, into a person's life where I'm going to be uncomfortable. Lord, let, let me manage it. And so what we tend not to do is we tend not to ask the question of where where he wants us to follow. We just decide where it would be good for us to go. And, and, you know, we're like, okay, we'll follow the Lord in the places we're comfortable with, right? That kind of tends to be our wiring sometimes. And uh, so, so I, I hear a song like this, and it's like, and I, and I get to those lyrics, and I'm like, okay, Lord, help me. Help me to really follow like that, to wherever you call me. Help me, teach me, lead me to follow, because I know what my heart and my head want to do. I know that going into uncomfortable places, into unfamiliar places, into uneasy places, or into the lives of persons that, that maybe make me a little uncomfortable or nervous, that I know what my, my tendency is. It's my tendency is to kind of shrink back and, and, and get back to the comfort zone. And, and Lord, if I'm going to be the, the witness and, and the person that you've called me to be in this world to show your love and your light, then you've got to give me the strength to do it. And, and the Lord does not fail us in that. He promises to, to strengthen us every day, to help us, to teach us, to lead us. And it's that element of as we come to him, as we draw close, are we willing to come with an open spirit, with an open heart and mind that he can continue to shape? Praise be to God. Because if it wasn't for someone else who was willing to be shaped in that way, we wouldn't be here. Because there were people who put it all on the line and they said, Lord, I'll follow wherever. Lord, the idea of teaching a bunch of little fourth graders in Sunday school terrifies me. But Lord, if that's where you've called me, then I'll go and I'll serve in that way. Lord, the idea of working an overnight youth lock-in petrifies my soul. But Lord, if that's where you've called me. Lord, the idea of talking to a college student who seems to be running their own life their own way according to their own wants and their own will I'm not sure I have the words, but Lord, I trust you'll give me the words. Lord, I'll, I'll walk alongside anybody that you want me to, anybody that you call me to. It's, people did that, and they did that in our lives, and they were there, and we can, we, can, we can probably look back, and we can name some very critical people in, in the development, the growth of our faith walk. Because they said, Lord, whatever it is, I'll step into that gap and be your witness. Praise be to God. Amen? Gracious Lord, we thank you. Lord, we thank you for those that you raised up as you were in our world, as you, as you walked and you mentored the disciples and you mentored others. And, and Lord, they, they took your word. They took your promise. And they took the proclamation that you are our Savior who rescued us from sin, who freed us for joyful obedience and, and made us into vital witnesses of your holy kingdom. Lord, they took that message and they passed it on. And for generation upon generation, that message has been passed on. That truth, that promise has been passed on, Lord. People stepping into the gap and saying, Lord, I'll follow you and I'll be your witness. And Lord, we are here today because the message has been passed on again and again. And now, Lord, we are the ones that take it up. We take up that responsibility. We take up that call. And we pray that each day, Lord, sometimes each circumstance, that you will guide us. You will teach us. You will put us in us a, a spirit determined to serve you no matter what. Lord God, we love you. We seek to honor and glorify you in all that we are and in all that we do. Amen. 
All right, friends, you ready to get in the Word? Are you really ready to get into the Word? Because I love getting into the Word, you know I do, and we are going to talk about a topic that Jesus loved to talk about. We're going to talk about the topic of love, and we usually like this word, right? You know, we, we talk about love, this is great, because for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. But what happens when we turn love up on its end, and we're called to be the ones who love? How do we do it? How do we love? Because love is this kind of ambiguous thing where, where it's like, is it an emotion, or is it a thought, or is it, what is love? I mean, is it a demonstration? Is it... We have all sorts of different images of love, and one of the reasons why we get in trouble with it is because we have one word, love, and we go back into most other languages, like for instance, the language that Jesus was speaking, that the New Testament is largely written in, Greek, um, you'll find that there's four different words that we translate into love. So you can have four different words with four very different definitions, and yet we just come into English and we say, ha, one word will do it. You can see how that would get us in trouble. And sometimes there's areas of the Bible where it says love and then it kind of, it describes it in the context what kind of love this is, but other times it just uses the word because that's what's there and we're supposed to figure it out. So when I think about this image of over the course of the last, you know, last, what, six, seven weeks here, we've been talking about how to build a life on a rock solid foundation. Because Jesus said there's two ways to build a life, on rock and on sand, on a solid foundation and on one that's shifting. And, and if we know that a life built on a shifting foundation is going to collapse, is going to bring us nothing but trial and struggle and strife, we know we don't want to build there, but sometimes we don't know the difference between rock and sand, do we? I mean, if we did, we'd always build on rock. But, but this world sends a lot of deceptions into our lives where, where it confuses us on what really is rock, what really is sand. And so we're going to talk about this image of love because I think that's another critical thing when we talk about building on the rock. It's Jesus' love demonstrated toward us, and then Jesus calls us to demonstrate our love toward others. So let's get in some, into some images of love that are in the scriptures. You'll be familiar with some of these. Uh, Matthew 22, 37, 38 says, Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. Seems simple, right? I mean, well, maybe not simple, but it, it's a clear call. Love the Lord your God. Let's go on to the next one that follows it, because Jesus says, and the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commands. Let's keep on rolling. We'll look at a couple other scriptures here. In Matthew 5, 44 and 45, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And now Jesus is meddling. Because loving God and loving our neighbor, I mean, that, that's not too bad, but now you've got to love our, our enemies and even those who persecute, those who attack us. He says, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the, right, on the righteous and the unrighteous. And if you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are, you not, are not even the tax collectors doing that? I think we got one more here. Coming into John 15. And we've got, my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. So those are just a few of the passages on love. And they tell us we're, we're to love God, we're to love our neighbor, we're to love our friends, we're to love our enemy, we're to love, we're to love fellow believers, we're to love non-believers. I mean, we have the, this call to love, but the question might be, how the world do we do it? Well, maybe we start off with that first one. That image of, we'll go back here to, to Matthew what did I have? Matthew uh, 22. There we go. So Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And then the one right after it, he says, love your, the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commands. Now, where I get into this is this image where Jesus said, our, our evidence of love is by our obedience. This is found in the Gospel of John. Let me take you to John 14, 15. It says, if you love me, keep my commands. Into John 14, 21, it says, whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. And then in John 14, 23, it says, Jesus replied, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and we will come, and we will make our home with them. 
So there's a lot of scripture, a lot of scripture about love. And Jesus says, if we want to fulfill that first commandment, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your strength, the key is, is that we do what? We obey, right? But he just said, if you love God with all you got, and you love your neighbor as yourself, all the law and the prophets hang on that. So we know we want to love God. We know we want to demonstrate that love every single day in, in how, that we, how we live. But do we love our neighbor in the same way? If all the law and all the prophets and obedience to all the law and the prophets hangs on obedience to this command, how well are we doing at it? How well do we do at actually loving our neighbor? And what does it look like? Is it an emotion inside? Is it a thought in our head? Is it the fact that we can pray about them when they're messing up? And that, that, that's an act of love? Is it, what, what does it look like? I want to take you over to 1 John. We're going to be in the third chapter. We're going to be in 16 through 18, where it says, this is how we know what love is. Jesus laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or a sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and truth. And so in 1 John, we hear this call that love is not a feeling. Love is not a thought. Love is an action. It's an action toward our fellow person. It's an action toward our neighbor. It's an action toward our friend. It's an action toward our enemy. It's an action in which we reach out sacrificially and respond to the needs of another. Sometimes that takes us out of our comfort zone, though. Have you ever been there? It takes us out of our comfort zone because what we've been taught in our society is that if you are going to give, to give of yourself to another, if you're going to sacrifice for another, then they should be worthy of such a sacrifice, right? And we have kind of judgmental attitudes of what makes a person worthy. We're not just going to throw money at anything. We, we want to make sure that you're going to use it wisely. We want to evaluate that. We're going to look at all sorts of clues in order to... Or maybe it's that the idea of, oh, I'm willing to sacrifice, but don't move me beyond my comfort zone. Don't take, don't take me outside of that unless it's really worth it. And so it's worth it for people that I know and people that I value and people that are good to me and people that are my friends and people are whoever we put in that group. But who gets excluded? What happens to the person who fumbles their life all up? They've made a series of wrong choices, and God calls us across their path, and we have the opportunity to bless them. Do we bless them? Or, or do we look at their life and say, you know, if I help them, if I bless them, if I come alongside them, they're just going to misuse it. How do we love in action? And not get our, our, our human attitudes wired in there. I, I think so often, I mean, we, we'll think about, we don't want to throw money at something, but maybe the more precious commodity that we struggle with engaging in is our time. Our time is precious. And the idea of surrendering or sacrificing our time, of costing ourselves time in order to be a blessing to another, again, are they worth it? Is it worth investing in our neighbor? We might rationalize yes because of what we see, but then we go into others where Jesus said, love your enemies, and things get a little more dicey, don't they? Love those who persecute you. And we think about those actions towards somebody who persecutes us. It gets more difficult for us to be the witness of Christ as he's called us to. And probably every one of us, if you're like me, you're thinking right inside of yourself of somebody right now. 
somebody that, that, that you've struggled with just this kind of thing, maybe recent, maybe a while ago, but, but someplace where you, you've struggled with this, this stepping beyond your comfort zone, stepping beyond that place, and, and giving sacrificially for the benefit of another because of the choices they've made or because they've made an enemy of you or because they've attacked you. or We struggle with this in terms of the way that Jesus did it. We're like, but wait a second. They haven't earned it. They don't deserve it. They don't. And yet there's a man who hung on a cross for your sins and for mine when none of us deserved it. He showed this unwavering love, this unwavering love toward all of us. His action was in full for all who would receive. He didn't predetermine who got the benefit of the cross before he hung on it. I want to take you to Luke 6. Here's another passage that we hear. It says, if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them, and if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that, and if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners expecting to be repaid in full, but love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to them without expecting to get anything back, and then your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High, because He is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Isn't it annoying when Jesus meddles? It wouldn't it be nice if we could just stay in our comfort zone and love as we feel comfortable? Jesus taught about the kingdom of heaven and the nature of what that kingdom is like and the nature of what's going to happen when he returns. He talks about when he returns, there's going to be a separation. A separation of those who are his followers and those who aren't. And this image of love in action is at the very center of it. I want to take you to the core scripture today, and it's in Matthew 25. It says, when the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne, and all the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left, and then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For when I was hungry... You gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. And then the righteous will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? And the king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these my brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. When you think about this image of Jesus separating us, dividing us along what? Along that image of love in action and when we, in which we look out for our fellow person, in which we reach out and we are the presence of Christ in helping those that are on the journey in this world with us. It's so easy to, to look past them. It's so easy to decide what we're comfortable with. It's so easy to decide whether they deserve it. It's so easy to decide those things and say, nope, not here, not me. I'm not willing to surrender and sacrifice such that they may know that, that they may experience the love of God through my action. I don't even know how to I don't know how to do this. I mean, it's easy to preach this, right? It would be easy to preach it, easy to discuss it, easy to, easy to sit in a Bible study and learn about it, and we're sitting there and like, yeah, that's how we should be. And that's how, but, but we got to go beyond these walls, and we got to live it. And it's just as hard for me as it is for you, because that human mind, that fleshly attitude inside of us, pulls us back to the, the, the worldly way of thinking. 
in which we want to judge according to our human thoughts, to our human understanding, and we want to only give to the deserving. But if Jesus only gave to the deserving, then none would know him. Because really none of us deserved his grace. None of us deserve that love poured out on the cross. Every single one of us is a sinner saved by the mighty grace of God. And we might be able to pick and choose and say, oh, this person, they, they're running a more divergent life. They're straying more. They're turned more away from God. But in the eyes of God, a sin is a sin is a sin is a sin is a sin. And it doesn't matter whether your sin is murder or whether your sin is lying. In the eyes of God, it is all on the same is rebelliousness against the Lord our God. It is breaking and severing of that relationship. And he hung on the cross for all those sins. And he paid the price for all those sins. And he redeemed us and made us part of his family. And then he said, as part of my family, as part of my household, as you go out into the world, you make sure the world knows what my household is all about. That's what Matthew 25 does, where he says, the kingdom of heaven is like this. The kingdom of heaven is like the Son of Man comes and does the separation and looks not at the deeds that were done, but rather looks at the actions that we take toward everyone in the world and that we don't have a little pickiness where we say, well, I'll do it for my friends. I'll do it for my nice neighbors. I'll do it for the people who do good to me. I'll do it for the places where I think they're going to use it right. But we pour forth the grace and the love and the mercy and the kindness of Christ in every life, in every place that he calls us. You're sitting there saying, my gosh, pastor, if I do all that, I won't have any time to myself and I'll have all my money, I'll be gone. It's like, have you ever seen God do that? In, in rare lives, yes. But in most of our lives, God calls us to those situations and those circumstances where he has purposed us and where he has said, I am going to use your voice and your witness in this circumstance. And he has Christians around the world, and he calls all of us as one body to be his witness. And if the body keeps on stepping back and saying, no, nope, it's out of my comfort zone, sorry. Nope, they don't deserve it, Sorry. Nope, God, look what they did to me. Don't think so. Christianity will fizzle. It will fade. It will die if that's the way we stand. Praise God for all of those who stood in our lives and said, Yes, Lord. I'll step in. I'll teach. I'll witness. I'll serve. I'll go, and I'll sacrifice. Love is an action. The love Christ calls us to when he calls us to love our neighbor is an action. And he says, all the law and the prophets hang on this action. And our action of loving our neighbor the greatest evidence that we love the Lord our God who is the head of the house, the house that we represent. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. And I'm guessing that you're probably a lot like me because we're all in this together. We all have a pretty similar challenge here. And that every day I need to ask for God's help to do this. Because the flesh is going to battle back. Our old way of thinking is going to battle back. But Christ conquered it all. He conquered sin and death in us. And placed in us eternal life. And placed in us a new heart. That we would be witnesses for his family. Gracious Lord and God, thank you that your love for us has never wavered. Lord Jesus, you hung upon the cross until all our sin was paid for, until we were freed from sin and death. Lord, you welcomed us into your family, placed your Holy Spirit in us, and you call us your witnesses 
your ambassadors. You call us pastors and teachers and mentors and friends and Lord, you call us out into a world that so desperately needs to know you. And so, Lord, when we proclaim where you call, I will follow. We ask your help, your strength, and your leading every day. I pray in your holy name, now and forevermore. Amen. as we pour our lives into the lives of those around us that they too may know a Savior, may know the love of a Savior, the faithfulness of a Savior who went to the cross for them, went to the cross for you and me. Amen? Friends, let us go forth in the love of Christ this day. Amen. Amen.